This is the Multi-Faith Matters Podcast. I'm your host, John Morgan. This is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters, and I am the host, John Moorhead, and I'm privileged today to have a returning guest, Ryan Burge. Ryan, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm going to read just a little bit of your bio. We're going to be discussing uh, Ryan's new book here, 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America, which I must admit, as someone who used to think he was pretty well informed on the subject matter, has bought into some of these myths himself. And uh, Ryan's going to shed light on some of that for us today. Let me read a little bit of your bio here so folks can get a little bit, uh, little bit of background. If they haven't seen our prior conversation that we had on the nuns, uh, Ryan P. Burge is an assistant professor of political science and graduate coordinator at Eastern Illinois University. He teaches in a variety of areas, including American institutions, political behavior, and research methods. His research focuses largely on the interaction between religion and political behavior, especially in the American context. Burge is the author of The Nuns, Where They Came From, Who They Are, and why they are, uh, Where They Are Going. He is also a pastor in the American Baptist Church, having served his current congregation for more than 15 years. And once again, we're privileged to have you here. Thanks so much, John. I'm really glad to be here. Well, folks can look in the uh, program notes as well as uh, wait to the end of this uh, podcast conversation and click if they want to look at our prior conversation on the nuns. We'll touch a little bit about that today, but we want to discuss this new exciting book of yours, 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America. How in the world did somebody with a pastoral background um, get involved in, in research and data to begin with? And then what specifically led you to focus on this subject matter? Well, I've always done both. You okay. know, my, my entire adult life, I started as a youth pastor when I was 20 and I started going to grad school when I was in, I was 23. And when I was in grad school, I was actually a pastor. I actually tried to walk away from the ministry at one point, but then another church called me to be their pastor. Um, so I, I've continued to try to walk away from the ministry, but it keeps clawing me back year after year. <laughs> um, I've always kind of seen myself as a, I'm, I've been bivocational you know, my entire ministry career. I've right. never, it's never been my full-time job. I've never worked at a church where they really needed a full-time pastor, to be honest with you. Most congregations in my denomination, especially in my region, just don't need that. So they need someone to fill the pulpit and, you know, I'm happy to do it. And so, you know, for me, it's just always just seemed natural, right? Like I, I'm interested in religion. I'm interested in politics. I'm interested in how they interact with each other. I see religion and politics every day, you know, both on both sides of my career. So I, you know, it's like asking a fish, what the water's like. I don't know anything different. You know, this is all I've done basically my entire adult life. So to me, it just works. It works naturally. And it doesn't seem contradictory to me that I do both. It just seems like this is just who I am and what I do. And it, you know, just sort of makes sense to me at this point. Yeah. It doesn't seem contradictory to me at all. I'm, I'm drawn to this kind of stuff. I, I did uh, interim pastoral work at various times in the past. Um, so I'm familiar with that aspect. I'm certainly more drawn to the research and how this applies to pop culture and politics and all that kind of thing. How did you specifically come to this volume? Did you just start discovering that some assumptions weren't, weren't adding up? You decided to expand it and tackle these subjects? Yeah, I mean, Twitter is like my, my, my research playground, basically. And I'll see, you know, kind of these ideas bouncing around, like in these conversations, and I always like, like to be a bystander, you know, like in social media, it's fun because you can watch other people have a conversation, but you don't have to engage in it. They don't have to know you're there. And so you see these people like make these assumptions about things, you know, like how does religion work here and how does politics work there? And, you know, if you dig in the data, like I do, you know, every, literally every day for the last five, six years, you start understanding that a lot of things that we believe about the social world, the religious world, the political world, just don't stand up to academic empirical rigor. And so I wanted to create this sort of volume that was easy to read. That's something I always focus on. I want my work to be, you know, accessible to a general audience. I never want to write for my academic friends because there's not enough of them to justify, you know, writing a book. So I wanted to write 20 
discrete chapters that I thought would be self-contained and that you could read one, you could read seven, you could read three, you could read 20. You don't need to read them all in order for them to make sense with each other. It's an easy book to kind of pick up and put down. I wanted a book like that because honestly, logistically, it's easier to write a book like that too because you don't yeah. have to try to like create like this whole narrative and theme. You have to write like 20 individual containerized chapters. And for me, I would go every week on Monday and go, okay, we're going to write one or two myths this week. And I banged through, you know, over a course of a summer, I banged through all of them real fast because honestly, they were always top of mind. I already done some data analysis on most of them and it just kind of flowed naturally. And, you know, and hopefully a lot of people are reading the book and finding things they didn't know about the world. Yeah, I certainly uh, found it fascinating uh, when I, I saw you promoting it somewhere else. It was another podcast. I thought, man, I, I've seen your work on the nuns. I got to follow you on, on social media. I need to pick this up. Um, one more thing by way of introduction before we look at some of these myths. Yeah. Um, in your introduction to the book, you talk about we live in a world that's so polarized, we don't share the same facts or we don't see the same facts anymore. What, what are the challenges that you saw going into this and how are you trying to help readers overcome that? Yeah, I, 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 I was actually, it reminds me, I was listening to a podcast this morning about you know, they were interviewing Russians on the street in Moscow, asking them, showing them pictures of what's going on in Kiev with the bombings. And one guy just looked straight at the camera and goes, that's not happening. Hmm. You know, just just straight up denying what's happening. Right. In, in you know, in, in, they don't think it's an invasion. A lot of Russians think they're actually helping the Ukrainian people. Like they're actually giving them coats and clothes and food and all this stuff. That's the kind of environment that really scares me is where we can't even agree on the facts anymore. How do you move to things like policy? if you can't even agree on what the problem is. So I've always positioned myself very intentionally, by the way, as some sort of objective or as objective as you possibly can be person to say, I'm going to give you, you know, the data as clearly as I can find it as most directly without any sort of, you know, bias. I'm always trying to fight my own bias. And so actually I wrote the chapters in such a way where I was thinking of all my different audiences, right? Like what evangelicals might like chapter one, but they might not, they might not like chapter seven or, you know, chapter 10 might feel good for them, but chapter 12 might feel bad. I want some chapters to feel good to people. Like they're like, ooh, that feel makes you feel really reinforced. But then other chapters, I want them to be challenged by that and go, wow, I didn't really realize the world looks like that. Because I think the thing about facts is they don't care how you feel about them. You know, they don't care what your partisanship is, who you voted for, your race, your gender, your age. They don't care about any of that stuff. Facts are facts. And our job is to take those facts and do something with them. So if I can just say, here's the data, now figure it out. I think I've done my job. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of these uh, myths here, and uh, hopefully that will motivate folks. So they'll, they'll find something of interest here, even if we don't hit on everyone that they like uh, to motivate them to pick up a copy of the book. Uh, myth number one, evangelicalism is in decline. I must admit, this is one that I had uh, ascribed to, uh, and I think I'm fairly well read. I know we all have uh, cognitive biases and this kind of a thing. Um, I know that evangelicalism in America is facing some serious challenges, particularly in a post-Trumpian, if we can call this that, kind of era. Um, but I always thought that, uh, Pete, there was this exodus, particularly amongst the young and so on, and therefore this narrative that is, is very popular in progressive evangelicalism, uh, but not so much for conservatives. But tell me about that. How, how is it evangelicalism yeah. not in decline in America? So uh, there's a couple of ways to think about this. One is through tradition, right? You can be evangelical by what kind of church you go to, like Southern Baptist, Assemblies of God, non-denominational. If you look at the graph from 1972 to now, if it really depends on how you want to cut it, you know, what your starting point is. If you start in 1972, which is far back as the data goes, there are actually more evangelicals in America today by percentage and population, you know, mm -hmm. raw numbers than there were in 1972. If you look at 1993, it's the peak of evangelicals. So we started out at 17% in 1972, jumped to 30% by 1993, and now we're down to about 22%. So if you're, let's say, a progressive evangelical or a, an atheist, let's say, you want to you want to start that thing at 1992 and say, look at the decline, 30% to 22%. But if you're you know kind of looking at the data objectively, you should go back to the start of the data, which to me is in 1972. I can't go back any farther than that. And if you look at the data it was 17% in 1972. It's 21%, 22% today. And then if you look at other questions like, do you self-identify as an evangelical? Do you Are you evangelical or born again? Yes or no? In 2008, 33% of Americans said yes. In 2020, 34% of Americans said yes. I mean, they, they're self-identifying. And everything, everybody seems to think that are outside evangelicalism, that the brand of being an evangelical is tarnished. 
right? Like it's, it's so dirty now because of Trump and MAGA and, you know, all the things that go along with that. That's not for every action. There's an equal and opposite reaction. Right. And I got I wrote a piece in The New York Times a couple of weeks or a couple of months ago where I basically make the argument that evangelicalism is not declining. It's being radically remade mm. and that we're seeing, you know, the share of people who are evangelical, but attend church once a year now is 40 percent. It was 27 percent in 2008. So we're seeing non attending people grab onto the label of evangelical. But we're also seeing non Protestants say they're evangelical. So Catholics, Jews, Muslims, Latter day Saints are all saying they're evangelical at higher rates than ever before because they're drawn to the political context, Mm -hmm. right? The cultural context of what an evangelical means. So what I argue is for every person that was pushed away from evangelicalism because of Trump and MAGA and all that stuff, there was actually someone pushed towards evangelicalism because of Trump and MAGA and all that stuff. So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So just so folks don't misunderstand, uh, you're, you're talking primarily here about numbers and a sense of identity. You're, you're not saying that American evangelicalism doesn't face its branding challenges, right, in a post-Trumpian yeah. world. Every time I look at social media, it, I think evangelicalism in America needs some change, some introspection, some self-critique. Um, but I do kind of tire of this evangelicalism is America's whipping boy now and, and so on. So you're, you're saying in terms of other factors, you're not saying it doesn't need to look in the mirror, but that it numbers wise, it's doing fairly well. Oh, listen, I, I'm with you there, John. I think evangelicals, uh, I think they do take maybe more than their fair share of criticism, but I think some of it's self-inflicted wounds, right? right the fact right. that, you know, 60 percent of Southern Baptists want to reduce legal immigration to this country by 50 percent is something you need to really sit back and think about what that, why, why is that happening? Why are people being drawn to the evangelical label who are not Christians, who are non-attending Protestants? Because they like this anti-immigrant sentiment. They like this mm-hmm. culture war CRT discussion. Right. And if that's how you want to be branded, that's fine, but fess up to it. That's, that's my issue. They, you know, a lot of people say, no, no, being an evangelical is about believing in Jesus and the resurrection and things like that, which is true. But at the same token, that's not what the culture's ingesting anymore. They're seeing to be evangelicals to be a conservative Republican who's, you know, you know, on culture war issues or anti-abortion, anti-gay, anti-transgender. So what are you doing by positioning yourself in a certain kind of way? You're welcoming in a crowd that you might not like, but why are they, why do they feel welcome in your ranks? What have you done to roll out the welcome mat for them? That kind of question demands a lot of introspection. So I do think a lot of, you know, some of the criticism they receive is, you know, undo. It's just a whipping boy thing. But I do think a lot of it is, you know, they set themselves up in such a way that this is, this is the world they created for themselves, like it or not. Well, related to that particular topic is uh, chapter two or myth two. Donald Trump wasn't the choice of religiously devout Republicans. Uh, right? yeah. right? That's been some of the some of the I don't know, justification, self-justification, I guess. Well, it may have been for those who weren't devout, but but us good devout evangelicals, we didn't vote for him. And you're saying it doesn't hold up. Yeah, that's that's one that like it's it's so like hooked in it's like ingrained deeply in our understanding of religion and politics now is that trump was the champion of the non-religious republicans first off you can't win the nomination by riding the backs of non-religious republicans okay you know it just doesn't make any sense only 12 percent of conservatives have no religious affiliation it's 45 percent of liberals you know so you can't win with that coalition if you look at the data what you see is amongst people who attended never they preferred trump yearly they have preferred trump Monthly, they preferred Trump. Weekly, they preferred Trump. The only area in which white Republicans did not you know, favor Trump was weekly plus, which is more than once a week. And their crews won that segment by about 8%. But that segment is less than 10% of the population of Republicans who voted, right? So how do weekly white evangelicals vote for Trump in the primary? This whole thing of like, oh, they voted for him. Well, first off, they want to deny the fact they voted for him in the primary. But then they say something else like, oh, but we held our nose and voted for him in the general in 2020. Then why do they give him such high approval ratings all throughout his presidency after that? I mean, that, it's, it's this constant like trying to like embrace conservatism but walk away from Trump at the same time. That just doesn't make any sense to me. They like Trump. And the more you go to church, the more likely you were to vote for Trump in both 2016 and 2020. 
What does that tell you about what's going on with, with the population, the Republican base? There's just no evidence out there. There's this large contingent of evangelicals who are like, yeah, I wish I, we were Ronald Reagan conservatives. No, no, they are Donald Trump conservatives now. He is the party. That's exactly what they want. Now you have to ask yourself the question, why did they like Trump over Cruz? Right. Because Cruz right, right. is I mean, Cruz is an ideal evangelical candidate. Right. He's got the bona fides. His dad's a pastor. He goes to an evangelical church down there in Texas or Rubio, who's Catholic, but also goes to an evangelical megachurch from time to time. Why they prefer. You know what I think it is? It's because both Cruz and Rubio were talking with the Bush administration about a pathway to citizenship for people who have been here legally for a long illegally for a long period of time. But I've not broken any laws. Right. And you know what Trump comes out and says? No, no immigration. We want no immigration in this country at all. I think that's what a lot of people were drawn to with Donald Trump. They liked that position. It's just no Republican would say that. They were trying to be moderate on immigration, and Trump was being conservative on immigration. They liked that about Trump. And like I just told you, 60% of white or of Southern Baptists want to cut legal immigration in this country. So you cannot give me some kind of line of, oh, no, no, no. The only kind of immigration I'm opposed to is illegal immigration. No, no, no. You're opposed to all immigration. Most of you do not want people coming here from other countries, period. You need to introspect on that and figure out why that is, because that is not what evangelicalism has, has taught historically, right? Evangelical institutions in America are consistently saying we need more refugees to this country, not less. We need to open our doors legally to a lot of people who are struggling. And the rank and file evangelical says, no, we don't. We need fewer immigrants to this country. Why is that? Is it xenophobia? Is it racism? Is it you know scared of the other? Is it uh, economic insecurity? That's the one thing I'm always interested in, by the way. The people who are most interested in cutting immigration in this country are the oldest Americans. Why would that be? It's not because they're going to take your job because when you're 65 years old, you're not working anymore. So why are those people the most anti-immigrant? Let's dig into that for a second because you look at the data, it's kind of painting a picture of like these people are not super interested in welcoming the stranger. Why is that and where are they getting that messaging from? Well, let's talk about that for just a little bit, for a little uh, a moment. Uh, when Trump was in office, uh, he seized upon post 9-11 fears and we had the Muslim, so-called Muslim ban, yeah, uh, which just seemed extreme in light of what had taken place. And then you had coupled with that, you know, this build the wall kind of thing. Those might seem as two unrelated kinds of phenomenon, but I think a case could be made that they're connected together. It's part of a broader anti-immigrant stance amongst his base. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, that what is if you said, like, what is Trump known for? You know, ask the average American, like policy wise, what would they say? I think immigration would have to be right top of the stack, wouldn't it? Right, I mean, right. I, I can't. Uh, uh, but China, uh, maybe. But, but no, I, I think immigration is what got Trump to the White House. And what, what's really interesting to me is you have like companies like World Vision in the Christian space talk about we need more. We need to help immigrants, help refugees. There's such a divide in evangelical spaces right now between the establishment, which I hate using that word, but you know what I mean when I say it, right? Like, you know, people at Christianity Today, your David French's, your Russell Moore's, your Ed Stetzer's, people like that. Right. And the rank and file people in the pews, right? The rank and file people in the pews are to the right of the average evangelical leader now, which I don't mm -hmm. think was the case 5, 10, 15 years ago. I actually think the average Southern Baptist pastor was to the right of the congregation until Donald Trump got elected, and now they're to the left of the average congregation. I bet you most Southern Baptist pastors got the vaccine, probably both doses and a booster. You know what? In the congregation, about that level is lower, right? Stop the steal. I bet you most evangelical pastors do not believe the election was stolen in 2020, but in the pews, I bet it's a majority, right? On immigration, like we just talked about, there's a huge gap. There's this growing divide. And there's a here's like a, a terrifying extension of this. Okay. Who speaks for evangelicalism anymore? Who is this? You know, it used to be like Billy Graham, you know, when he was at his peak, we all like, you know, it was Billy Graham. He's our guy. And then we went through a period where there's a couple of people who maybe did, right. You've got, you know, Rick Warren at one point was really popular. You know, you got Franklin Graham, you know, at one point he was really popular too, kind of riding on the coattails of his dad. And then last year, Franklin Graham comes out on Facebook and says, I got my vaccine, both doses. I think it's the Christian thing to do for everyone to get the vaccine. And you know what? In the comments, he got drugged through the mud up and down, left and right. You're a terrible person. You're spawn of Satan. You're all. But it shows you he doesn't even speak for the rank and file evangelical anymore. And so it's basically a leaderless movement that's all bottom up and being led by crazy people online. 
There's not any more establishment, you know, people from the top saying, we don't do that. We don't believe that. Now, it's any idiot on social media can say something that's anti-immigrant, that's xenophobic, that's racist, that's misogynistic, and people latch onto that. They believe that the election was stolen when it wasn't stolen. They believe vaccines are bad when they're not bad. So they're, belie- they're not even trusting their pastors anymore. I mean, that's a terrifying future. If you're a pastor in a Southern Baptist church, the people in the pew are not listening to you. What do you, how do you do that? How do you deal with that? How do you move on in a world where no one's listening to what you say every Sunday morning? Yeah, well, it's kind of like I feel on this podcast. You're trying to make a difference by using social media, but it's the, uh, for lack of a better term, it's uh, questionable folks that, uh, you know, get get the most, it's amazing. I look at their social media feeds and their YouTube and all this, and they just get huge responses. Um, I, I'm, I'm envious and wish somehow I could figure out how to tap into that, but you know what Monica Linsky said? She said, you know, she thought about this a lot, obviously, because thank goodness that happened, you know, Monica Linsky and Bill right. before social media, because, you know, it had been awful. She said something really interesting. She goes, I think everyone in America deserves a voice, but I don't think everyone in America deserves a megaphone. Right. And, and I think that's the problem is the nut jobs. Social media amplifies extreme views, extreme opinions, and that is objectively bad for our country. But again, how do you police that? How do you corral that? How do you, you know, say like, listen, those are those views are too far outside the mainstream. We haven't come up with a system to do that. And what makes it really difficult is it's so easy to amplify a crazy message because of social media. You could write something crazy on Facebook. It'd be shared 10,000 times in the next hour and reach a million people. Before social media, it would take years to get to a million people, you know? So that's the problem is we don't realize the amplification is never the moderate, you know, middle route, you know, common sense message. It's always the nutbags on each side who get amplified the most. And that does convince some people that those people are right and furthering the polarization that's happening in America. Yeah. Well, let's talk about another myth that uh, I think a lot of evangelicals would be uncomfortable with because it doesn't fit their definition. Uh, Myth number eight, you have to go to church frequently to be an evangelical. Yeah, that's the one that I'm going to get a lot of pushback on. I already have gotten, you know, a lot of pastors and theologians kind of shake their fists and go, this is what an evangelical is. You know, when, I just told you, when we asked the survey question, we asked it to everyone. Are you a born again or evangelical Christian or not? And if you're Buddhist, you can still you say yes. If you're a Muslim, you can still say yes. It's up to you whether you're evangelical or not. I don't, what I always say is, it's not my job to tell you what you are or what you're not. If you you tell me, you know, Maya Angelou said, if people show you who they are, believe them. If people tell you who they are, believe them on a survey. So if you look at the data, what you see is that someone who identifies as evangelical, whether they go to church or not, are more conservative, more Republican than one who does not identify as evangelical. Why? Because what people do is they try to figure out who, who I, who am I, where do I fit in social space? Like who are my people, you know, who are against me and who are for me? So what we try to do is kind of set down markers and say, this is what I'm for, right? Like you see this on the right a lot. People say, I'm a patriot, which is like a subtle way of saying I'm a conservative without saying I'm a conservative because it's like a dog whistle, right? People are like, Oh, I'm a patriot too, right? I'm a freedom loving person. (laughs) Who is not a freedom loving person, for God's sakes? You know, Sarah Palin did this 10 years ago. She said there's real America and fake America. You know, like real America is like the rural heartland and all this kind of stuff. So what we try to do is like put ourselves in social space. What we're seeing is evangelicalism has become this term that's jumped the fence from like a traditional theological understanding. And now, you know, for instance, 50% of Muslims who go to mosque more than once a week and identify as Republican also identify as evangelical. Why is that? It's because they think evangelicalism means I'm devout, religiously devout. I go to church a lot. And two, I'm conservative, theologically and politically. So what they're taking is evangelicalism now is just a big moniker for I'm, I'm a religious conservative that goes to church a lot, whether I'm, you know, Protestant, Catholic or whatever it is. And, and the, the thing is, and this is the thing we all struggle with is no one owns the term. You know, it doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to, you know, Franklin Graham. It doesn't belong to Wheaton College. It doesn't belong to anyone. It means whatever the person who answers the survey question think it means. And my job then is to figure out how they got there, you know, how they construct that reality and who they say I'm with. And what we're seeing is that it's not about a belief in penal substitutionary atonement theory. It's a belief that the Republican Party is good and liberalism is evil and Donald Trump is the savior. That's kind of increasingly what we're seeing in the data. Did uh, any of your research on this particular myth dovetail with the phenomenon that uh, Josh Packard has called the duns? Uh, not, not the nuns that people are familiar with, but those duns, those who are devout, active, giving financially to their congregations, and yet in their estimation, 
that congregational life participation in it was somehow hampering their vibrant Christian spirituality. And so they pursued other avenues for that. Yeah. So the thing about religion is it's so multifaceted, right? You know, it's, it's an impossible concept to define. And I, and I've written several pieces of measurement, like how to measure religious stuff on surveys. Cause it's so the way we think about it is behavior, belief, belonging, right? So there's three dimensions of religiosity. Behavior is like, I go to church. Belonging is like, when I ask you, what are you? You say I'm Protestant or Catholic or Buddhist or whatever. So you belong to a tradition and then belief is just like, what do you believe about God? Do you believe God exists? Do you doubt God's existence? Do you think there is no God? Things like that. Here's what we know. Attendance is the first thing that goes. Like that's, that's like over 40% of Americans say they never step foot in a church building. 40%. It's growing every year. It's growing rapidly, actually, every year. Um, and the next thing that goes is belonging. That's where people say, I'm not Protestant. Or I'm not Catholic anymore. But the last thing that goes and this is like that whole like done, done thing, spiritual, but not religious thing. Right. Only about 10% of Americans say they don't believe in God or they cannot know if God exists or not. Right. So an agnostic view or an atheist view, only about 10% of Americans hold to an atheist or agnostic view of God. That means 90% of people believe in God at least a little bit. And here's what's even more fascinating about that. If you look at people who never attend church, who say on service, I never attend church, they're just as likely to say, I believe in God without any doubts as they are to say God does not exist. So even amongst the never attenders, one in five of them believes in God without any doubt, and one in five of them believe God doesn't exist. So belief is this really stubborn thing. You know, we're a persistently believing country. Even when I talk about the nuns rising and all this stuff, I want to always kind of underscore that by saying, yeah, but we're not a secular country. We're not, a, you know, we're a non-religious country. We're not a secular country, right? We're non-religious and we don't go to church very much, but we're not secular that we adopt a, you know, humanist worldview, a scientific worldview. We still, the vast, vast majority of us still believe in God at some level and still feel like spirituality is something we should try to, uh, you know, be more of. So a lot of spirituality in this country, not a lot of religion in this country. That's, that's really what's on the decline is religion. Well, related to that, you've got, and you, again, for the, the listener and the viewer, you and I have devoted a whole prior conversation to the nuns, and folks can check that out. But myth, eight, uh, myth 15, the growth of the nuns is largely from people leaving church. Yeah. So there's this idea out there, our churches are hemorrhaging, and they're all becoming nuns. You're saying that's not true. Yeah, it, it just doesn't make any sense, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, every pastor thinks that, like, I, if I give a good sermon, I'd be very evangelistic, then I'll grow the church. Our right? people won't leave the church. W what we're seeing more and more is that, so I looked at people 18 to 25, and when they we moved into adulthood, you know, so the earliest, you know, what they were, um, back in the days, the 1970s, 1980s, about 10 or 12% of those people said they were raised with no religion, and now it's a third of them say they were raised with no religion. So one out of three people never had religion to begin with now. And what we also know is um, religious retention. So amongst the nuns, it used to be that two-thirds of them came back to religion. Now it's only one-third of them comes back to religion. So what we're seeing is generational replacement, which is how everything changes in America, basically, is through generational replacement. Very few things change because people change their minds. There's a couple examples I can think of. Marijuana and gay marriage is like two examples of things that have changed because people change their minds. But when it comes to religion, what it is, is consider this. So the silent generation, those people born right before, you know, like right before the greatest generation, 71% of them are Protestant or Catholic, okay? And about 15% of them are nuns. Um, amongst Generation Z, 37% of them are Protestant and Catholic. 45% of them are nuns. Mm. So every day in America, you're getting people at the top, that, that top old, you know, generation dying off, 71% Christian. You're being replaced by 37% Christians every single day. So just by doing that, you're naturally seeing religion decline over time. Now, I actually think that creates an interesting opportunity, though, because a lot of pastors kind of assume that America is generically a, a Christian country, and it still is, but it's increasingly becoming not that case, right? So now these young people are growing up in an environment where there is no religion at all in their household. So they have no concept of, you know, the story of Jesus or the Good Samaritan or the prodigal son or, you know, uh, the Exodus story and the 10 plagues. They don't know that at all because they've literally never walked in a church building before. That kind of evangelism has to look differently than the other kind of evangelism, right? That is more, I'm just trying to like apologetics you into a belief in God. It's going to be like, they got nothing to start with. 
So I think the church is going to have to kind of refactor and rethink and recalibrate how they reach out to this growing group of Americans. One third of Americans grow up without any religion at all now, probably going to go higher than that at some point. And I think those people, a lot of them, I always tell people, I think here's my hopefulness, right? I think what kids want to do is they want to rebel against what their parents are all about. And for most of American history, the rebellion was my parents are really religious. I'll be a nun. I'll be an atheist, right? I'll, I'll push back against that. But imagine you grew up in a household where you're third generation atheist. You know, the most rebellious thing you can do right there is start going to church, you know? <laughs> right, so I, right. I do think there's going to be, you know, there's going to, the pendulum's going to swing back the other direction for some of these families because you know, these kids are going to be like, hey, you know what? Mom and dad, I know you don't believe in any of this stuff, but I believe in it a lot as a way to kind of stick it to their parents. But, you know, the church wins well, for whatever reason people come. So I think the future looks a lot different when it comes to religion and that, you know, the default is not Christianity anymore. The default is going to become none, non-religious. And that's a different world. Yeah. So these constant calls to come back to church um, and our apologetic approaches that we often think are speaking to the outsider, but many times actually just confirm the faith for the insider, make them feel better. We, I mean, you're speaking not only as a scholar, but as a, as a pastor, you know what the reality is. Yeah. And that's, and it, it's, 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 it's it's hard to do both these jobs sometimes because I sometimes people ask me questions and I say, okay, do you want to respond as a social scientist hmm. or do you want to respond as a pastor or do you want both? You know, and how did all those things play together? I would be the first to admit I'm biased, you know, like, but the, the thing is all of us are biased, right. you know, like every researcher is biased towards a certain position and they can try to fight it as much as they can, but you're going to eventually, you know, it's going to come through and I'm, I'm biased. A lot of people working in this space are non-religious people. That's their bias. I'm a religious person. That's my bias. Mm -hmm. You know, one person told me one time, and I think about this all the time, just because I can't draw a perfect circle doesn't mean I should stop trying, you know? And, and so right. that my goal is to try to move us towards an objective look at this whole thing. I'm trying my best. I'm not perfect, but I'm, you know, the alternative is much worse, right? Which is people. And I talk about this in the book. People are trying to push an agenda because it makes them look better or make another group look worse, or they're really just trying to change minds by using false data. I mean, there are books written in this country that I've had to review for different stuff. And I look at it and go, this book is completely full of garbage because this person works for a very conservative organization that wants to push a certain narrative, which is a really weird interpretation of the data to make that look a certain kind of way. I don't do that, right? I try to give you something you like, something you don't like, something that'll encourage you, something that might discourage you, but that's kind of what data does. If it reinforces your priors, you're not really being an objective data analyst. And I think that's kind of what the book is, is my, you know, is my accumulation of all this stuff that, and some of the stuff in the book, I don't like, you know, I don't like that it's there, but again, my job is not to tell you how the world should be, but tell you how it actually is. And then let you respond to that. Right. Um, let me get your feedback on one more myth before I ask you to talk a little bit about how we move forward from this situation where we have all these errant ideas. Uh, myth 19, young evangelicals are more politically moderate than older evangelicals. That's one that I kind of leaned into. For example, I'm hearing, and I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I've read a few pieces that said, for example, on the Israel-Palestinian conflict, that more younger evangelicals are starting to be supportive of the Palestinian cause and not just Israel. I don't know if that would be considered a more moderate kind of perspective, but speak to that myth, if you would. Yeah. So you got to think about what it means to be like an 18 to 25 year old in 2022. You know, the world that's around you, the political world, the social world, the culture world, evangelicalism is, you know, it's got this position in American society and American life. And imagine you're, you know, you're a high school graduate, you just graduated high school and you're surrounded by people who are LGBT, um, you know, that are, that are, that are gay, that are lesbian, they're bisexual, they're transgender. It's hard. It's going to be hard to stand up in a classroom full of people like that and say, yeah, but I'm an evangelical and the Bible says you're sinning. You know what I mean? So you got to think if, if there's so much social stigma around these ideas, you're going to want to resist that unless you really, really believe it to be true. Right. So my, my, my belief is in, a, in the book, I talk about like you're making a reduction, like a chef makes a reduction, like on the stove. Right. That, you know, you put a lot of ingredients in, you put a lot of water and liquid and stock and things like that, and you cook it for a long time. And, and a lot of that stock boils off. So the actual volume of stuff gets smaller, but the concentration of the flavor goes up as the volume goes down. So amongst young people, there are fewer evangelicals, 
but they're more fervent in their beliefs because they have to be because they're facing all this external peer pressure to be LGBTQ affirming. And they're saying, no, the Bible says I, I should not be that way. So if you look at them, you know, kind of in political space, they're as conservative as their grandparents are. You know, a, a, a 70 year old evangelical looks a lot like a 20 year old evangelical when it comes to politics. Right. It's interesting that actually their parents are more moderate than they are because uh, they grew up in a different time, obviously. But so I think that's it puts you to this gauntlet of you have to kind of fight and, and, and juke and jive and get around all these people who are saying, oh, you're you know, don't be judgmental. Don't be you know, don't be evil. Don't don't be hateful. But you're like, no, the Bible says this stuff. So if you have to constantly defend yourself it actually kind of makes you dig in your heels even more and be like, you know what? I am full on Trumper, right? I'm full on evangelical. And so I think that's what we're seeing with these young evangelicals. There's fewer of them, but they're louder. They're prouder. They're angrier. They're more resistant to the change. That's what happens in a culture where we sort of boil off all the people in the middle. You're just left with people who are angry on both sides. And you've got a lot of angry secular people and you've got a lot of angry evangelicals among the younger generation. Well, again, you're discussing these 20 different myths, and I'm sure there's far more of them out there. Who knows? You might have enough for volume two as things go. But uh, you don't just leave us hanging discussing the myths. Uh, you've got a conclusion on, uh, let's see, a better path. Now, I don't know. Speak to us either if you want to wear the sociologist hat and then the pastoral hat or wear them together, whatever you want to do. I think we need to hear both perspectives. How, how do we navigate through this? Yeah, so... I think the thing that I, I want everyone to be, you know, kind of thinking about is always be willing to change your mind. You know, there's nothing wrong with change. I, I, there's this, this toxic kind of thing going through American culture where, you know, this happened in 2004 when John Kerry changed his mind on the Iraq war. And then all right. the Republicans are like flip flop, flip flop. I want someone who changes their mind. Yeah. You know, like, I think that's a good thing. Uh, I talk about in the book, you know, I saw this, this, this guy at a protest and he held up a sign and said, sorry, it took, so took me so long to get here. I had a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like the most humble, beautiful, brilliant expression of humanity that I can ever imagine. Right. Like I am willing to listen. I'm willing to take in information that I disagree with, I'm willing to process conversations with people I don't like. And so in the book, at the end of the book, I compare two different people, um, Robert McNamara, who was the architect of the Vietnam War, um, really was kind of pinned with all the terrible things that happened in Vietnam, the bombing of Laos and Cambodia, um, the killing of a lot of innocent civilians, right? In America, he basically became the villain in the story. A lot of young people really thought that he was evil incarnate. Um, in his older years, he did a documentary called The Fog of War, um, which is an amazing piece. It's just talking to him. He's like 80 some years old. You can tell he's on his last legs, but you can tell that he spent the last many years trying to think through what he did. And, you know, he kind of comes to this revelation where he says, I don't think Americans fully understand the full impact of war. And I think we need to talk about that a lot more. You can tell that he's talking to himself now, right? Like he made mistakes in Vietnam and he regrets some of the things that he did with Vietnam. And then compare him with Donald Rumsfeld who died last year, you know, Donald Rumsfeld, the architect of us invading uh, Iraq, which was an absolute unmitigated uh, nonpartisan disaster. That was a complete mistake. He went to his deathbed believing that what he did was right, um, never changing his mind about his position on Iraq. And I think we should be a lot more like Robert McNamara and a lot less like Donald Rumsfeld because you can make a decision that you think is right at the time, but you are also free to look back and retrospectively think about your decision and go, I was wrong, and here's why I'm wrong, and I'm sorry. There's nothing wrong with that. I actually think there's a lot of value in that. And I think when I'm vulnerable like that with my students, with my, other, my fellow colleagues, I think it actually makes me a more full person and a person that's more transparent is a person I like more. I want to see your thought process. There's nothing wrong with changing your mind. There's nothing wrong with coming back to where you came from and saying, I don't believe that anymore. Or I was wrong when I thought that, or I'm sorry I said that to you. So I think that's the thing about what draws us. If anything to draw us together is always have that sober second thought of, man, maybe the other side does have a point on this. And maybe I don't have it completely right on this. Because that's what gets us to dialogue and debate. If we don't dialogue and debate, we got nothing. We got we have no we got no foundation for discussion. We got no compromise. We got no way to move forward. So I hope my hope in the book is it opens some minds to the idea of you can change your mind, you can rethink things, and you can come to a new conclusion. It doesn't make you a bad person. Actually, I think in some way it makes you a better person that you're willing to do that. Well, and for Christians looking for a theological hook to hang that on, uh, I think they need to look no further than something like Philippians two 
where the Apostle Paul reminds the Philippians of the example of Jesus in exercising humility, being willing even to go into the point of death yeah. uh, on the cross. And, and if we if we want to emulate Christ, humility is an important and un, unfortunately in Amer the American context, at least, an often neglected Christian virtue. And doesn't Paul say we must work through our salvation with fear and trembling? I think so. I think it's in there somewhere. Yeah. It's in there somewhere. Like work. I love the phrase work through it. Right. You know what I mean? Like not like you just turn the light switch on. Like yeah. it, it's a dimmer switch, right? Like you, you go closer, you go farther away. You need to work out what you believe, not just arrive at it, but continue to arrive at it every day. Nothing wrong with continuing to work on yourself. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. This is a fantastic book. And again, it is 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America by my guest, Ryan. There it is. There it is right there. Watching the video version on the screen, you'll find a link to this uh, book in the program notes. And uh, I hope as well as uh, his prior book on the nuns, uh, pick it up and uh, follow his work on social media. Ryan's doing some Great stuff to help us uh, really understand what's going on with religion and politics in America. Ryan, thanks you again for being a guest on the program. It's always been fun, John. I really appreciate it.